Okay, good afternoon everyone. The last session of today deals with uh, uh, sounds of city life and uh, I want to thank Massimo Garai and Dario Dorazio uh, to s invite me to chair this session. Uh, sounds of city life uh, is the, uh, the experience, the everyday experience of all of us and uh, you know that people living in uh, urban areas are exposed to uh, many type of noises uh, coming from different uh, type of noise sources um, for instance uh, sound uh, road traffic noise can be considered in terms of the soundscape definition the keynote sound of our city and in addition to this type of noise we have a lot of other type of noise like also neighbor noise that is uh, uh, coming uh, uh, more uh, diffuse spread uh, and spread in time and space as also we learned this morning from the very interesting uh, lecture we have this morning also early this afternoon mitigation action may be more efficient uh, when the noise control, the traditional noise control technique are integrated with the soundscape approach which is uh, focused on perception. And I think that uh, one of the most uh, positive results in, I would say, in the last 10 years is the awareness of all people uh, working with noise that the perception is uh, the most important issue can and uh, it can provide useful results and then as we also learned this morning and this afternoon an holistic approach is uh, strongly needed we have five papers i uh, we are very uh, strict on time and i will start with my presentation uh, let me just Move to the other one. Uh, this, uh, this one. Okay. As you can see in the title, we made an experimental investigation in the archaeological area of Foro Romani Rom is one of the most uh, visited sites uh, uh, in Italy. Uh, what kind of jetty we have? To try to classify the soundscape and develop a model to predict the class and membership. Uh, as we will see, we have eight sites and uh, the outline of the presentation is very short description the case study location experimental procedure we use the statistical analysis data results and discussion and conclusion i think it's not necessary to to show you what kind of the area is you have colosseo here and also all the foro romano and palatino units here is one of the most visited places as i said before but is uh, surrounded by very busy roads and so there is a lot of road traffic uh, coming into the area affecting the enjoyment of the area uh, of the tourists uh, according to the municipality noise zoning the area should be very quiet because it's the green one and these are the limits according to the italian legislation well these are the limits of the legislation but is the area quiet and this soundscape is suitable to improve the enjoyment of the visitors of the area unfortunately not because as i said before there is a lot of noise coming from the surrounded uh, roads around the area and uh, we made some uh, sound work uh, just outside the area and you see that uh, one of the most used indicators, the equivalent noise level, is uh, mostly in the range between 70 and 75. So it's not absolutely acceptable, this kind of situation. At the beginning, uh, well, until the early 80, 1980s, uh, 
the Colosseum is, it seems strange, but it was uh, like a roundabout. All vehicles run around. Afterwards, we have uh, some restriction, uh, so they implement the pedestrian area, and also some more recent restriction regarding private traffic in this uh, route, the white one. Uh, so we made uh, some measurement campaign uh, in uh, eight points, uh, three inside uh, the Foro Romano area and uh, all the others uh, just outside and three of those uh, were uh, around the Colosseum. What we did, a uh, field survey, so we make interviews to people uh, um, during their visit uh, in the area. We made uh, some measurements in fixed position. As I said, we distribute the questionnaire for the interview. And uh, as equipment, uh, you use sound level meter and sound recordings for a later analysis of the uh, acoustic data. And also we take pictures. Uh, because, uh, thanks to the recordings, we are, were able to uh, determine a lot of acoustic parameters uh, in each site, and uh, some of those are very well known, and others are main, the main psychoacoustic parameters like loudness, sharpness, roughness, and fluctuation strength. Because these data are more related on uh, the way the, the human perceived the sound, so it's thought to be more related to the answer given by the subjects. The questionnaire is a very long one. Uh, of course, it starts with personal data, the motivation to be in the area, and so on. I cannot explain all the information we got, but uh, we have uh, a lot of questions and people, I would say 90% of the interviews uh, were uh, tourists and they were uh, happy to participate in the study, regardless of the length of the questionnaire. Of course, in some circumstances, because especially for non-English uh, native language, uh, they asked for additional information from the interviewers, but um, it was a very good uh, experience. Of course, uh, we talk not only in terms of noise, but uh, in perceived quality of non-acoustic uh, factor, uh, so security, maintenance, cleanliness, environment, of course soundscape, but also we have landscape and smell. Uh, about the sound, we categorize the sound in 13 categories and we ask uh, which when uh, were able to heard, to be heard, and making the area pleasant. The same for the visual elements, and for soundscape attributes we ask for pleasantness, uh, eventfulness, uh, ex exciting and uh, cool, more chaotic, and more or less the same for landscape. Uh, okay, and then at the end of the questionnaire, an overall judgment of the area. What about the statistic analysis? Of course, we use, well, we use uh, uh, as our choice, uh, an open source uh, environment for statistics. Uh, I, I think that uh, is one of the most used uh, all over the world. And uh, we got uh, a very large uh, matrix of data. We, uh, we got 28 variables, 15 acoustic parameters, entity by subjective responses. They are ordinal variables in this case because of the scale we use in the questionnaire for a total and a total 212 observation for each variable. What we can do with this data set? Of course, we can start with descriptive analysis, but uh, of course, this is not uh, the main aim at this stage of the study. It was presented elsewhere uh, previously. And so we start to study the correlation between the parameters we get. Then we made the cluster analysis to classify the sites on the basis of the uh, data we get uh, from the survey, so the ordinal one, from the acoustic parameter, the continuous one, and also all the data joined together. And at the end, we try to to uh, the binomial logistic regression to develop a model to predict uh, the cluster membership. 
These are the results of the correlation between the ordinal variable, the subjective ratings, and you can see the, pleasant, the pleasantness of the soundscape is strongly related with the soundscape quality. But you see that all the uh, correlation, even if the weak one, are all positive. What about the acoustic parameter? These are the acoustic parameters. You see that there is a very strong correlation with, with most of the parameters, and only fluctuation strength and uh, sharpness are not very well related with the other parameters, and sharpness and fluctuation strength, especially fluctuation strength, have negative correlation with the other parameter. And this can be a way to reduce the number of variables in the model you have to keep only the parameters uh, subjective of acoustics that are uh, strongly uncorrelated. And this is the, uh, the representation with all the variables. You see the subjective variables very, very uh, low correlated with the acoustic indicators and with acoustic indicators the correlation is negative and weak. What about the clustering? Of course we use some technique very well known in the statistical world, I would say, and uh, some packages uh, in air to make also a sort of validation of the cluster and choose the most suitable um, cluster, of course when I say suitable with the data. Also, we took the Euclidean distance between the observation and we used the scale values because uh, in some circumstances, like acoustic parameter, the scale used for the parameter, like uh, the LQ, is completely different uh, in, in numerical terms with the uh, value used for, uh, I would say, fluctuation strength and so on. So scale value is important. This is the output we got with the subjective radius, only two clusters, and you can see how the, the sides were grouped. In cluster one, we got all, I would say, the silent uh, um, sides, and cluster two, the most uh, noisy places. But of course, you see that we cannot get 100%, so of course, there is a, a, a a variation in the subjective ratings. And so I just uh, uh, group the, the sides according to the majority uh, of the consensus. What about the continuous variable, the acoustic parameter? Well, the technique suggests to have a different uh, uh, clustering algorithm and uh, suggests to have four groups instead of two, but this is because of uh, site 12, cluster three and four just began to uh, site 12. And afterwards, we decide also uh, to check the agreement between a subjective classification and classification by acoustical parameter. Uh, you see in the table that uh, the agreement is not very high, and uh, you know why, because soundscape is a perceptual construct that uh, depends on several parameters, uh, vari variables, not only the acoustic one. At the end, we made the clustering with all the variables, so 28 variables by the k-means, and we get two clusters. And in these two classes, in cluster one, the predominant sounds were by humans, and in cluster two, by technological sounds, like mainly road traffic. What is the, the main feature of these two clusters? You can see here, in terms of soundscape quality, pleasant and eventfulness, excitement, and calmness, you see the cluster one, where the human, the sounds from humans is predominant, I, I get very larger results from the uh, soundscape point of view than we get in size where the tra road traffic noise was predominant. And in the, on this, the other uh, diagram, we see the results uh, of the two clusters depending on the acoustic parameter we choose. You can see that the difference between the two clusters is very, uh, is very clear. 
Now, the last part of the study, uh, try to find a model to classify the sites according to this uh, cluster membership. We made, of course, a lot of models. Uh, we, try, we start with all the 28 variables, then we take only the subjective rating, only the acoustic parameter, and at the end, by the stepwise forward and backward uh, binomial uh, logistic regression, we got uh, with, a f I would say, not the final, but a very interesting model having only two parameters, the perceived soundscape quality, so a subjective data, and the LA50, an acoustic parameter. And here you can get uh, some indication of the classification performance of these models. Here you can see, starting with the all 28 variables, the confusion metric, that means uh, how right is the prediction of the model uh, uh, compared with the uh, results we get from cluster, and also the importance of the variables, which are the most important variables within the model. Here is uh, uh, the model with only the subjective variables, and you see that the performance is very, well, it's not good as all the variables, because there are some confusions between the two clusters. And uh, the variable important is the type of the soundscape. If the soundscape is uh, mainly from humans, from uh, natural sound, or from uh, uh, technological sounds. Then the model by the acoustic parameter only, and the performance is uh, mm, close to the all, mo uh, all variables model, is not uh, very bad. And the most important variables within this model were uh, the percentile LA50. And then, as I said before, because the step for, uh, and forward and backward for variable selection, we, realize, we obtain this model from the binomial logistic regression. And you can see here how the model can distinguish between cluster one and cluster two depending on the value of LA50 and the value of the soundscape quality. There is a very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, not very high influence of the soundscape quality, but also the variation of the LA50 between cluster one and two is very, very small. So we, if we compare the confusion metric we got with this uh, model, only two variables, with uh, the complete model, the full model with 28 variables, you can see that the results are very, very satisfactory. We have only two variables here, and we have got 28 variables in the other model. And the results, you see that we have only three cases of uh, misclassification. So, of course, the study confirms that uh, sound work uh, is a method to get acoustic parameter and subjective appraisal, and they are is very important for soundscape characterization. The statistical procedure, of course, may assist uh, in order to reduce the number of variables and to classify the soundscape. And the further study maybe can be to develop different algorithms and different models, such as, for instance, but there are a lot of uh, ways to do that, random forests and neural networks. Thanks for your attention. If you have any question, yes, please. Yeah. Well, um, the comparison from the point of view of statistics is, uh, is weak because uh, the, the sample is uh, too much unbalanced. So uh, you can test the difference, but uh, it's not balanced, the, the samples. Other questions? Yes, please. Maybe a fundamental question. We don't know about the LA cube. Yeah. How do you recover the importance of LA cube? 
Well, well, of course, first of all, I don't want to generalize the results. The results depend on the data we get. So I cannot say that LA50 is uh, the solution from the domain of uh, acoustical parameter. It depends on the data we got. But if you, um, uh, if you think that LA50 means the median value of the sound pressure level, it sounds not very bad. Is it particular case in like, like your space? Well, uh, we, the only experience we had before was in the archaeological area of Pompeii. And maybe is a, a chance to check uh, in the previous experience, we, we get uh, that with the new technique uh, of statistical uh, procedure, we can get the same results or a different one. It's a good suggestion. Any comments or further questions? If not, we can move uh, to the next presentation. The next presentation is by Calleri, Astolfi, Pellegrino, Orecchia, Di Stefano, Bo, Strepi, and Aletta. And the, paper, the presentation will be given by Calleri. Calleri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brambilla, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, the study which I present today uh, deals with the um, influence that the soundscape and lightscape design might have on um, uh, safety and social present perception. Um, the study was uh, conducted on um, specifically on uh, an area which is uh, uh, an under, underground pedestrian passages, so uh, an example of area which is likely to turn into a no-go area and uh, uh, it's been conducted through um, virtual scenarios, so um, uh, using laboratory tests. Um, as we know, sounds and lights uh, have been uh, already studied in depth uh, with respect to their influence on uh, safety perception, uh, of course, and also somehow on uh, social presence. Um, for example, uh, sounds have been studied since the 80s with respect to commercial use, so how it could uh, improve uh, uh, clients' purchase and so on. And it has then been expanded towards um, open areas and especially, especially uh, towards uh, like areas which are likely to have some safety issues like car parks and so on. And also light, of course, has, uh, has an impact on, uh, especially on safety assessment. So previous studies have found that um, there is a relation with the uh, lighting, outdoor lighting and uh, safety perception and uh, uh, the way in which light is used in the space can also influence, the, for example, the perceived restorativeness in a space. So the case study is uh, this Concourse Bridge, which is in uh, Sheffield University campus. As you can see from the pictures, is uh, an underground passage which is under um, one of the main roads which are crossing this area. And the area has already been uh, the object of an infield study, which has been conducted um, uh, one year, um, sorry, two years ago, almost, uh, and uh, in which some. Um, Background music has been applied to the area and um, uh, people behavior has been monitored through cameras. So it has been found that uh, background music, especially um, uh, classical music, can influence uh, the people's duration of stay in the area. So um, how are um, study design? Uh, well, well, there are two let's say two consecutive studies that has been conducted as master thesis projects within the energy department of Politecnico di Torino. So the case study is always the same and um, the path that the studies have been following are, are, are parallel, let's say. So we have uh, an example here of the, how the soundscape study has been conducted. This was the one that was, let's say, in a timeline was conducted before and uh, it is object of a, let's say, in a um, publication which is in press. So uh, it was, there was a data collection in field, then a 3D modeling and a calibration, and then uh, oralization have been con conducted through Odeon software to 
perform subjective tests. Um, 18 different scenarios had been studied, namely uh, three different uh, observer positions, uh, two layouts of sound barriers, and three types of uh, background music solutions. Um, the results of this test had been proved that um, uh, music can have a significant influence on safety-related perception and social presence, and that also the type of music is influential since we have that, uh, for example, in this case, jazz music as uh, higher level uh, provides higher level of uh, social presence and uh, um, comfort in the area. Um, this uh, also some uh, analysis were conducted also on um, the presence of noise barriers and uh, the, um, on the influence of part, uh, gender of participants. We can see that, uh, uh, as could be expect expected from previous studies, um, female participants tend to be uh, more to feel more worried or tense in the area. So uh, the, light the lightscape study was conducted. Um, after the previous one, and it uh, it has been chosen to f to use the same path. So again, data collection, 3D modeling, uh, model calibration, this time through Dialog software, and then um, graphic simulation, let's say visual rendering, that could use to pr to conduct a subjective perceptual test. Um, an evaluation of the present condition has been has been done, and then. Um, Again, the model has been uh, um, calibrated through Dialog software, and then all the three possible solutions uh, have been, uh, um, let's say, um, simulated through Dialog software and then uh, re uh, modeled through uh, 3DS rendering. Here we have all the different uh, solutions. So we have again uh, the, three, uh, the same uh, views that had been used with the soundscape, uh, sta uh, the soundscape uh, test before. But in this case, uh, the background noise is not changed. Is, uh, we, um, we just changed the lighting solution. So uh, we decided for this step to take soundscape and lightscape study uh, on a separate path. This is how the tests were conducted. So we used the anechoic chamber in uh, Politecnico di Torino in order to have a uh, low background noise. And uh, 30 participants took part to both tests. Um, so the, the reproduction, re reproduction setting was uh, the same for both tests. Uh, here we, we can see on the left part of the slide an example of how it was conducted. And people, uh, participants, after, um, un after undergoing a tone audiometry and the test to assess the, um, uh, um, let's say, norm normal, um, to, to assess the absence of uh, visual impairment, underwent this kind of test. So they had to, uh, for each of the scenario that was presented, they had to, to reach, to answer to all the 10 questions that you see on the slide, uh, using a one to five Likert scale. Um, so for each scenario, all the 10 questions were repeated. Then data were analyzed. And you can see that, we can see that, as we will see later, there there is a sort of let's say, parallel way uh, between sound and light, because also in this case, we can see that lighting solution can have um, a positive impact on, um, on the social presence and safety feeling. So you see that um, there is a tendency of uh, uh, lower, lower scores in negative attributes, uh, higher scores in positive ones, and also in descriptions that refers to how the passage is perceived as safe and, uh, and uh, socially alive, let's say. The statistical analysis also uh, confirmed these kind of findings, so, uh, and it underlined uh, also, with comparison to sound, a uh, much stronger influence of uh, uh, lighting, let's say, lighting solution choices on uh, the feelings of people living in, uh, let's say, uh, passing in the area. Because we can see that uh, uh, the scenographic uh, lighting solution has much stronger influence uh, on the positive feelings rather than just 
functional lightning, which is only aimed at reaching the normative uh, standards. Also in this case, uh, the um, gender uh, influence is confirmed. So as a conclusion, we can, see that we can say that there are some sort of uh, parallelism between the results and that um, the background music, so the soundscape design, can uh, increase safety-related perception and social present feeling in the area. And this is, so this is um, consistent with findings of the study that has been conducted in the area, because um, the infield study in this passage, has, uh, as, we have, as we have seen, has shown that uh, um, people tend to stop for longer times in this area when background music is played, but the type of music is also influential, and in this case uh, the findings are not consistent with the in-field study, because in this case just music resulted to have much positive influence, so in this case further studies are envisioned. And we can see a sort of parallelism between the results, because also, also lightscape, especially when it is somehow related to um, emotional impact, so scenographic view has a really strong influence and can uh, help um, avoiding places turning into no-go areas. As a further work, we are envisioning a, a construction of the same test with both soundscape and lightscape variation uh, integrated and um, an extension of the, of the test with a questionnaire which, which can link also the answers to uh, soundscape uh, descriptors and lightscape descriptors, and then the validation of the test with the uh, uh, in-situ test uh, in other university campus in Turin. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, one there. Um, well, I have, okay, here um, we can see all the comparison with the, all the, all the answer. Um, it's, yes, safety, let's say perception, because the, the question was this passage makes me safe, makes me feel safe, uh, or makes me feel tense or comfortable, so it's more linked to, the let's feeling. say, subjective perception, yes. Yeah. One more, yeah. Um, well, um, as far as the, let's say, uh, use of other vi visual um, means, we are uh, evaluating this possibility because, um, of course, when, uh, when we uh, talk about the, the possibility to, sorry, to expand the, the, the study towards in-field uh, study, we, we thought that indeed the, the restriction of visual field can be, uh, let's say, a bias in this study. And as far as correlation is concerned, um, in this step we, we evaluated the two facts separately. So in the soundscape study, the, the visual part was, was not changing, so the lightscape was always the same. And on the other way around for the lightscape one. So this was due to the fact that uh, in this step we had a lot of, uh, if we mix all the possible factors, we had a very huge quantity of scenarios, so the test was not possible to be handled completely. And so for next step we are trying to select 
some kind of scenarios from the previous ones and matching together in order to evaluate possible correlations. We have time for a very quick question. Yeah, please. Uh, among the two studies, um, not so much. So uh, this is the Lyscape one. We can see that uh, is, uh, there are the negative attributes, basically, that are um, uh, different. And in the other one, sorry for this. Uh, well, in the other one, um, we also have some difference also in the positive attributes. So yeah, there's some kind of different. But uh, we still hadn't go very uh, deep in this. Uh, let's say comparison. Okay, so we have no time for further questions. We move uh, to the second one. Thanks again for your presentation, and we are looking forward to look uh, to the next results where you combine uh, soundscape and lightscape uh, together. Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. Next presentation will be by Enrico Reatti, Expeditious and Diffuse City Noise Mapping Method on Light Zero Emission Vehicles. That's open. Do you get it? Okay. The floor is yours. Thank you. So, here we are. Dear colleague, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's late in the afternoon, I know. I try to be concise. I'm glad to be invited here. I introduce myself. I'm uh, Enrico Reatti, a freelance engineer working in acoustics. My favorite field of application is probably the architectural acoustics, but here I'm going to explain an, an environmental acoustic uh, idea. I'm uh, sorry, I'm a bit excited. I'm not so used to, to, to talk to a so high qualified audience. <laughs> My last conference as author was five years ago. So when I presented in New York this uh, idea. So let me explain it again. <laughs> and we are talking about environmental noise, the ensemble of sounds that are all around us when <laughs> we move uh, and live <laughs> In external public, pu yes, we have here a good example in low frequency. <laughs> and there is a huge variety of possible combinations, and our first purpose is to be able to record and map them. We are talking especially of cities and uh, uh, town areas, where knowing the distribution of noise level is important as knowing the condition of roads or buildings, or it should be. The common practice, uh, as we know, is to obtain a number of acoustic measurements under certain, certain conditions, so uh, winds is lower than five meters per second, no rain, no fog, no snow, uh, charter technician operating, and interpolate them to have an acoustic maps, uh, noise zoning, uh, and restructuring plans. Unfortunately, what I see is that public administration too often doesn't give uh, significant consideration to these acoustic data. Asking myself why, I guess uh, the reason are maybe one the an habit. Acoustic science is too young to be the first chair. Costs uh, for towns and small cities commissioning an acoustic campaign means a relevant cost. And upda updating of data due to the above reason, acoustic maps uh, are often obsolete, maybe all ten years old and they don't represent anymore the real uh, noise situation, as we can see in Rome, I, th I think. Um, sorry. Um, here I try to uh, keep in account this point. I try to design a method that simplify having almost a real-time acoustic data with low cost. It's a very alpha test stage. I'm not sure that it uh, could be a total alternative to the old procedure, but uh, I think it would give uh, in a chance. Now I, I show you a quick video that try to explain uh, this method.
Okay, that's just to synthesize. And so, what, what did the, what did we do in in detail? Hmm. Um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I choose an almost exclu exclusively residential area placed in class two in, uh, in a town and bordered by the main road with heavy traffic, especially during peak hours, to, just to have a, a clearly defined example to work on. My collaborators and me have flown, as you, saw, as you see, uh, the network of local roads uh, several times at different hours and different days. What were the equipment? Here we are. So, of course, a bike, the, wasp, the, the, the most well-maintained I have, <laughs> for noise, I think. And a GPS data receiver and logger, my smartphone with my tracks app, and a, a tachometer to control speed, to stay in a range of speed. And my sound meter in a backpack with a shock ab absorption uh, system. And, uh, we rode the bike at approximately constant speed of 10 kilometers per hour, and, and the, the satellite coverage was uh, uh, allowed a, a GPS precision of uh, 10, 15 meters. So, um, as we see uh, in the equation, it was good to pack data from sound meter in five second intervals to simplify later manual calculations. In this figure of the bike riding this road, uh, defined these red squares, but could be circles maybe, uh, defined by the, a noise level value that changes every time a new measure is done at the same position, as an average over uh, to the transits done. Okay, and to better explain, let th let's see these three pictures taken from the bike camera. They are in the same spots, but in different moments. Actually, they are taken at different times of the day, but with more riders, we have a situation like this. So, the same time. And we see, looking at cars, how in the same position, at the same hour or time slot, we have a variety of traffic noise situation, equal to extending sound meter measure one. If we imagine having, having a big amount of data, we may expect to have a, a representative, representative average of sound level always, almost always, up to date. As we said, the map is composed by correlating a number of rows of turn of values, latitude, longitude, and the equivalent sound pressure level defined before. Uh, that in big data scenery and higher GPS precision may change in temporal definition, making that shorter. After collecting the data, there is a post process of data filtering. The conditions are weather conditions that could be collected uh, days later from a weather station, excluding bad weather measures. Bike or vehicle, because it applied also to maybe electrical vehicles, very silent. Speed that may vary from 8 to 15 kilometers per hour, and then higher could be cut it off. And biker noise that we we'll talk about later. Another benefit of having a lot of data could be dividing the time slot during the day and splitting the week, the week between working days and weekends and the day period into, I propose, eight periods, differently from now that we have just two time slots, days and night. Interesting especially this fact for commercial purposes to better describe uh, the areas of the real estate market to potential buyers, for example. For example, elderly people will pay more attention at time slot just after lunch and uh, early in the evening, searching for a silent area. And this, uh, this is a very raw example with uh, uh, the data I collected uh, of an acoustic map referred to a particular time slot, uh, five to nine in the morning, the morning rush hour that shows the noiser part here in the, of the right, the red bright, uh, actually where the main road is. So. Um, the strength of this uh, 
logical noise mapping method is having a more detailed and updated output data during the day. It is totally ecological and above all, all capable of getting a large amount of data of information at low cost as it can take advantage, advantage of uh, existing services. The mid-level accuracy related to these monitoring, monitoring techniques allows to choose uh, measuring devices of lower class than the sound meter I used for, for the study, example of class two, significantly reducing the cost for equipping many operators. The aim of this method is not to fully substitute a traditional precise static monitoring, but to provide a real-time overview of a city at a big scale that may indicate critical areas to recognize or diffuse problems to analyze. Concerning possible future developments, uh, we may think linking together into an com economical device, a GPS, uh, a MIC, maybe, maybe not stereo, uh, a GSM module, and memory. So finally, we may have a data acquisition and automatic processing system, improving the synchronism between sound pressure measure and acquisition, acquisition of the GPS position, removing clock synchronization issues, and being able maybe to transmit data to a server. And the, the huge amount of data potentially generated by uh, this method should allow to generate extensive noise maps of our cities with uh, an iterative algorithm. In this test case, we verify the feasibility of the entire system, but on a limited number of record levels, uh, 30,000 more or less. And we create a few experimental noise maps, as we saw. Map is the last one. Map uh, generated by methods now have a spatial precision of 15 meters, while precision regarding time is related to the choice of uh, homogeneous range that can be restricted with a high enough number of uh, data input. The currency of the sound pressure level instead depends on the equipment used and is affected by the moving vehicle. Only, um, only for background noise level measure is less, less than 35 dB. So the strength, uh, as we see, is diffuse uh, uh, monitoring, large amount of data, low cost, uh, and their emission vehicles. The points to work on is uh, doing a portable hardware, sturdy and economical, doing the data acquisition automatic processing system, like filtering, interpolation algorithm, transmission and storage data, and working on the biker noise feedback, because uh, try to perform maybe an automatic self-learning analysis uh, for the first minute, for example, to define the acceptability of bikers in, term, in terms of noise uh, of clothes, for example. And I don't know, another idea, may, we may try to incentivate a, a silent ride with some slogan, like enjoy the city soundscape. And the application, what you see at the beginning, could be public administrations to uh, reduce costs, and also private uh, entities, real estate agencies, for business opportunity linked to, to housing advertisement, and uh, also extra data acquisition, for example, stereo signals uh, for future soundscaping projects. Thank you, that's all. Thank you for the very simulating presentation. Questions? Yes?
Yeah. Yes, it is. I said it's not a totally substitute to to these requirements. I just started from the idea to have an apparent wind, so just to can ride, uh, not saying still, uh, lower than five meters per second. The position is just to see in that uh, in future uh, experiments. Uh, how a, a mapping algorithm can simulate what we measure on the road. So, uh, if the, the, the data uh, at the road is quite um, good due to the big data, we may try to do an interpolation and uh, predict what is at the facade, the facade, I guess. Any other question? Yes? No, I, I said in the last uh, uh, a further development is to find maybe a uh, um, self-learning self uh, algorithm that can recognize uh, I mean from the, um, the noise from the bike I verified that uh, just riding the bike uh, in silent area uh, the, the, the noise is under 35 dB so uh, it's not so relevant. But uh, yes, if the, the biker talk every, <laughs> all the time, <laughs> it's a problem. In fact, uh, I think it uh, could be work um, more on, I don't know, people that usually going around for work, uh, or as I suggest, uh, trying to convince uh, riders to be silent. <laughs> <laughs> Or uh, yeah, or filtering out uh, all the the recognized uh, peak. Uh, the the main problem I, I think is chatting. All the others I ringing sometimes uh, will be average. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Or, or if you want the the Google Street View, but. Uh, <laughs> for, for sound. We have Thank to you. move uh, to the next yeah. presentation. Thanks again. <laughs> the next presentation is by Marcel Cobusin at the complexity in good current sound studies uh, on public urban spaces. Okay. Um, to start with a little bit of context. The aim of my presentation um, is to recognize and understand the impact and importance of sound for our culture. To acknowledge the effective working of sounds on organic, but also on inorganic beings. To investigate how uh, sonic marks guide humans, animals, things and events. In other words, the move I make here is from sounds as an object of study, the results of which can be articulated through text, words and existing concepts, to sound as a medium through which we can understand being in the world. And by understanding, I'm not primarily referring to rational thinking. By understanding, I mean, first of all, interacting, resonating, and co-vibrating. So what I present here is a move from, from speaking the sonic to letting the sonic speak. Usually, we tend to think that we connect to sound through our ears alone through listening and hearing. 
However, I support the claim that human perception is always synesthetic. All senses influence each other. I conceive of the senses as an integrated and flexible network. And as a consequence, I would like to defend the thesis that sounds don't need to be heard to be able to affect an atmosphere. However, by this I don't refer to silence or to ultra and infrasounds. What I would like to stress here is that sounds simply exist independent of humans who might or might not hear them. Conversely, sounds do need air and material to be able to sound, which is to resonate. Now, although my presentation has a philosophical background rooted in complexity theories and new materialism, my starting point is very concrete, and that is a square in Amsterdam. Now, why this square? The hybrid urban space in the center of Amsterdam, it, it's, it's a hybrid urban space in the center of Amsterdam with different, sometimes contradictory functions. It is used intensively, both as a passageway and an urban plaza for pedestrians, bikers, cars and trams. The square links various neighboring quarters and is situated at the intersection of traffic arteries. But simultaneously, which you can see in the picture below, uh, it has park-like elements, such as olive trees and luxurious wooden seats, so that it could be used for recreation as well. Now, then that's this so the overall atmosphere is not really good uh, most probably because of the traffic noise in short the square seems a more or less accidental sum of various functions without much coherence and this makes it a perfect case study uh, to research the relationship between urban morphology sound human and non-human actants so the research takes place in co collaboration with sound artists, city planners, policy makers, designers, residents and many others. As the project is still going on, my emphasis will not be on the results, but on the potentialities of the analysis and reflections. Which brings me back to the complexity theories and to new materialism. So, although I will certainly not deny that sound design, noise control, sound art, music or architectural acoustics are mainly meant to improve the quality of human life, here I would use insights from new materialism and object-oriented ontology to decenter human beings when thinking of sounds in urban environments 
and to take as point of departure the existence of a material world that is independent of human minds. So my first point is that a sonic materialism is a non-anthropocentric materialism, emphasizing the dy dynamic, temporal and process character of things and events based on the idea that matter has morphogenetic capacities of its own. And here I paraphrase Levi Bryant saying that despite the limitations of excess, we must avoid the thesis that sounds and the sonic environment are what our excess to them gives us. Objects or sounds have their own reality, their own openness, their own relations to their environment. So it is an argument against the tradition where humans do all acting and sounds are passive receptacles for human mental or social categories, as the vast majority of relations in the universe don't involve human beings. However, this is not an aim to subtract humans, but to regard them as ingredients in a symbiosis rather than as observers looking from the outside. My second point is that this new materialism or sonic materialism argues against traditional materialism in that it is not interested in what a sound is made of, of its components. It's even inaccurate to say that sound has this or this quality because it has a variety of different qualities because of the exo-relations sound enters into, so the relations that it has with other actants. Sound is affected, by which I mean that sound has various capacities to act and sound has receptivity to be influenced by other things, other events and other sounds. The third point I want to stress is that, is that actors interact so that a reality of at least one of those actants changes, which then gives rise to a new stage of that particular actant. If we call this contingency, this is not because any chance event might shift an interaction at any time, but because of the sensitivity to different possibilities, different interactions that prevail at a certain stage. And to be clear, the environment should also be considered as an actant. There is no such thing as an environment as such. It cannot be treated as something that is simply given. So what provisional reflection based on uh, these very brief ideas on new materialism and object-oriented ontology and on the project of this Mr. Visserplein in Amsterdam, uh, briefly described above uh, before, makes clear that a specific sonic situation, for example, depends on how materials act, react, and interact with each other. Each sonic urban environment consists of a unique combination of organic and inorganic objects, such as stone, concrete, plants, animals, water, glass, etc. Second, added to these influences, um, you, we can also think, for example, of temperature, humidity, light, etc. All of them partly depending on the time of the day, the season, and the weather conditions. Three, as important are the social, cultural, political, 
aesthetic, economic, ecological, historical, and even ethical actants which exceed but affect the oral aspect. Emphasizing the oral components doesn't mean to ignore the primarily visual, tactile, and or olfactory actants. In other words, sound studies should always be multi-sensorial. A wanted sound, especially an unfamiliar one, should be accompanied by other stimuli to ensure that it receives proper attention. However, explicit attention is not always needed, nor should it always be the main goal. Sounds can function while remaining unattended, or when they are mainly supportive. And five, it's time now to bring back in the human actants. However, uh, now as one actant among others, and in all its singularity, how someone will interact with this specific place, and in particular with the sonic components, is influenced by lifestyle, culture, expectations, the information one has about a certain place, the attitude, preferences, the motivation for being at that place, the activities someone wants to undertake, etc. And no, this is not a return to some kind of anthropocentric determinism as humans affect, yes, and are being affected by their environment. So, to wrap up, improving sound quality of our environment is not simply a matter of reducing noise, of taking away specific sound sources, or replacing existing sounds by either silence or other more preferred sounds. Sound is not a waste, it's a resource. Improving a sonic environment means dealing with a co complex system in which many heterogeneous actants interact and affect each other. And it is exactly this complexity that should be acknowledged and what makes it so interesting. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Yes, please. No, no, thank you. Yeah, maybe you can come just a little bit closer. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it is, it is very common in, uh, in contemporary philosophy eh, to call this new materialism, which basically um, hinges on, on two aspects. First of all, to, um, to get rid of the um, subjectivity of the anthropocentrism, so that humans are studying something. So actually what, what you then get is that something is what we can see or investigate about a thing. 
So whereas the claim of new materialism is that a thing or event or sound or whatever you call it is always much more than what humans can perceive or uh, how, how they can investigate a thing. So that, that is the first. The second is, uh, and I was referring to that briefly, is that new materialism is not interested in the intrinsic qualities of a certain thing or event or what, whatever, a certain material. So it's not about reducing the material or the object or the event to its uh, various components. Because that in itself is impossible because these components only show themselves in the interactions with other things and other objects and other events. And every time there is another interaction, then other aspects of that same thing or object or event will be shown. So in that sense, it is in an almost a Kantian perspective that this object is, by, by definition, cannot be known completely. Okay, we have time for uh, one quick question. <laughs> He, yes, he's, he's one of my best friends, uh, also from Holland, as you know. <laughs> I mean, more important than saying that, uh, uh, no, actually that is the most important, of course, but we, we together run the infamous Journal of Sonic Studies. So I think that should be uh, also something that you should note. Because, and, and to go to our, uh, it's an open access online journal, all about sound, so please visit it. Okay. Can the environment be a solid, a solid actant by itself? No, well, that is, that is what I, what, what I understand that you suggest, and my answer to that would be, well, isn't the environment from a context that does it? Uh, well, um, of course the idea of, of object uh, exists at many different levels. So let's say that every object or every event or every actant already falls always falls apart in many different uh, components or very, very different or many different other actors. So at a certain level of um, reflection and analysis, you can take the environment as one actant among others. But if you want to be more precise, then of course you have to, to say, okay, but the, but the environment in itself is not a complete known thing to us. It falls apart in very many different aspects and that is also why I brought in, for example, the, the social, the aesthetical, the ethical, perhaps the political, the economic, which is usually taken out of the idea of what an environment is. So to bring in these almost non-materialistic elements also make together make an environment. Okay. We have to move uh, to the last presentation. Thanks again for your presentation. <laughs> Me and the organizer apologize for the music coming uh, from outside. It's not authorized uh, and it's not expected uh, to be at this time of the day. So I think that we have uh, moved fast to the last presentation. Uh, by Alessia Milo and Yersha Reis, eliciting acoustic design, thinking with the sound works and an interactive textile sonic map. Yes, please. Yeah. Maybe I can help you. How does it work? Just. Um, Okay, can you hear me?
Let's see if I manage to get to the end despite the concert. So some introduction. Hello, I'm Alessia. I'm finishing my PhD in Media and Arts Technology, so it's an interdisciplinary environment, which it kind of fits uh, what we listen to today. Uh, my supervisor is within the Center for Digital Music, and I'm also part of the Center for Digital Music, so I've been exposed to many uh, different approaches to sound. Uh, my background is in architecture, and uh, I did my thesis in acoustic modeling, and then I moved to the soundwalk approach for reasons which are also kind of philosophical. And uh, I like to um, talk about, b before starting the presentation, about architecture, because uh, we had some example about vision and sound, and I like to say that architecture is not just focus on vision but it's focused on space and construct space and this space is usually delimited by materials which are elements and they are technical elements with physical properties and so this is how architecture and acoustics usually communicate and also architecture uh, is characterized by development of technology uh, similarly to acoustics and create affordances since we talked about Gibson for human life but also interacts with existing forms of life and uh, uh, of course it's good when studying acoustics to explore multisensorial design which is often not done um, interestingly, interestingly in these talks we so this focus on philosophy, um, which is quite uh, rare in scientific context. Uh, we, I think we lost a bit the sense of philosophy, and I particularly like this approach to time and temporal design, and interestingly also uh, the focus on perception and perception of objects. I, I think objects uh, are something that it's not really, I would describe uh, things related to sound as events because um, sound is characterized by time. It's impossible to think about sound without thinking about time. Um, while an object exists independently of time in a certain sense. So I would start with an example. This is Chichen Itza and I don't know if you ever saw any video or have been there. I haven't been there. But if you go online, you hear this guide clapping in front of the temple and demonstrate uh, the sound of the bird and the snake. So they build this temple for ritual purposes to kind of embody this um, characteristic of the, the god. And it's amazing how they crafted this uh, artifact, this temple, so well that you can still hear, if the stones are still there, you can see, still hear the sonic effect of the bird and if you clap in the other direction you can hear the kind of really distant flat echoes of the snake. Um, I also would like to suggest to read this paper because there's a very interesting literature review on categorization of auditory objects that we talked about today. And in this paper also they uh, criticize the fact that there are so many studies in laboratories and not many in the field about perception of sound. And um, without knowing this, I started conducting some sound walks and asking people to describe what they heard. And I was testing the spaces while I was testing also the methodological approach I was I wanted to use and I wanted to focus on um, design choices which have an impact on sound and how we perceive sonic environments so of course this is of interest of room acoustics and soundscape and I also particularly like this morning um, Ando's approach because I found this paper which uh, from Takatsu and Dando and there is this scale from one to one to one to I don't know, one million and architecture deals with all these 
differences in dimensions and, uh, and scale, which also have an impact on sound. So we can design cutlery, and which makes sound. Plastic is different from metal. Uh, Tablecloth, they absorb sound, or they can make sound. Chairs are moved. And architects actually create all these possibilities when they design environments. And so my approach was um, tackling this problem from different sides. Uh, designing a sound walk, which means how would you uh, ask, how would you try to create experiences for people according to what you want to assess, uh, asking them to list sonic textures and try to design my own tool for spatial sound notation and a study with an interactive textile map. In terms of sound walk, I chose Greenwich after some research because of uh, some interesting uh, links between the architect Christopher Wren and uh, maybe people he met, or the fact that there was the river, there were many open spaces, the place is still used as a university, as a conservatoire, so there were many different actors uh, interacting in the space. There were boats as well, and the history of the era was also something present. And, uh, of course, there was an architectural value because the buildings were still there, which is not really common in London, because they knock them down very often. And there was also some natural value. Uh, so the sound work was oriented toward listening to the whole sonic environment. And I was also asking the students, which were sound design students by the local university, Greenwich University, to make sound to reveal the acoustics of the space in a second task. Um, and also suggest some uses for the location. Interestingly, they uh, suggested filming in these locations and then they recorded some more sound. So I found that um, asking them to, so they were asked to draw the position of the recording dummy head, uh, which some of them did, some others didn't do. So for example, this one did. This circle uh, had some perceptual boundaries, so there was an acoustic horizon, which is uh, the limit until you can hear. There was a near circle and a far circle. And of course it was relative, but this allowed to kind of compare the observations between the different participants. Participants were only six, uh, and other 12 participants decided not to do the exercise while they were sound walking, which I understand because I was asking them to choose uh, freely what they prefer to do because they thought sound working is more like a holistic uh, meditative activity and um, so in some cases I found sonic textures were uh, represented as um, sources, sound sources in other cases they were presented as adjectives for other terms like splashy or squeaky or noisy, rumbly, so they were trying to describe sound in other cases, they wrote wet, for example, and they wanted to characterize movement, they wanted to give a boundary, and I found really interesting how all the participants described the different uh, events, and some of them, on this sample of six people, actually uh, elicited the same features, uh, and I tried to measure how distant to their perception they were. Uh, so I did this uh, assigning one in the middle of the head and zero on the acoustic horizon and measuring uh, in a Euclidean way, which maybe is not the most appropriate scale, but probably it's a good starting point. And, um, and trying to see if there was, so, there was also some kind of similarity in the angle. And in another, in this study I also uh, check which kind of um, uh, grammar these words had, so if they were noun, in verb, because it was not specified, and there were many verbs and verbal nouns, which of course uh, describe the characteristic of sound of being something happening in time and not just something with is, with, that is a source, because a source can also be off. And of course these, the sounds were sounds uh, coming from the activity of walking, so footsteps of the students and of the other people, they were also describing just sound or like onomatopoeia, and then there were other 
uh, characteristics, including ego. So ego was perceived as a sonic texture, which of course we, we know it can be reverberation, but it was a feature of these spaces. I also asked them to kind of uh, take some notes on this diagram. So I used this diagram to allow them to place their observation in space. Uh, so the sounds were absorbed by the ground, traffic voices, so it, it's possible to remember where these sounds were coming from. And so this is a table of, for example, echoes all around, stone cold, hard footsteps. So in this case, they were invited, even if they were not architects, they, they were invited to reflect on the materials of the spaces. This is another study done in Spitalfields, which is another area of London. And uh, in this case, I tried to use the notation using environmental noise measurements uh, and match it with this concept of pleasantness. And then pleasant sound sources were circles and the less pleasant sound sources were tri triangles. And I asked participants to mark as louder or quieter the symbols with more pressure on the paper sign. And they decided to describe the sources with words. I, did, I was not asking them. And I found from also another study that this is very important. So if anyone is trying to uh, ask people what they perceive words usually are more, tell much more than just symbols. Um, so the other participants, for example, they, they didn't. So the trains in this case were found pleasant. In another case, they were not found pleasant. Uh, so it, it really depends. And this. So the, the last example is this map I made out of the um, sound walk in Greenwich with the binaural recording. These brown areas are conductive threads. Uh, so if you touch them, they, the, the touch is detected by capacitive bores, which are then connected to um, uh, a big old bone black board, Bella. And uh, in this way, I could not just allow people to listen to the binaural recordings through headphones, but also capture their interaction. And uh, this was done in a study. Um, and in this study, uh, there were three groups, one with an ambiguous key map. The key map was like that, but without the words. So the words are to understand where these locations are. And without, uh, yeah, with, this is no key map. Without key map, the preference for the water location was consistently higher than uh, the preference with, with the key map. So the presence of these symbols, white, yellow symbols, uh, told people to listen to all the locations. While not having that, the attention was, of course, focused on some areas which were outstanding for their color, their size, or the, what, the content. So, of course, it's still not clear what, uh, how precisely this preference was determined by the sonic content or the map, but uh, at least it was interesting to see that the river location, the chapel entrance, which it's an octagonal dome uh, and the uh, courtyard with gravels, the conservatoire. And also it was interesting, I had a stronger preference. It was interesting to see how various these difference were. Uh, yeah, these were the locations, in case you were wondering. Also, I could see when, during the five minutes exploration, people uh, looked, uh, listened to the different samples uh, and for how long. And also I could be able, I, I could compare their listening strategies. So some people decided to listen to multiple locations at the same time. So they invented new spaces, mixing them. Um, so I tried to remove the context of the environment of Greenwich and transfer these recordings, uh, which could be explored to the map. But the, the map actually uh, traveled itself to different environments. So it, it, it was showcased in London, but it was showcased also at a conference called Sonic Environments in Brisbane, uh, which was the reason why it was made originally. Then a symposium about soundtrack soundscape uh, in an um, acoustician office, and, and all the time actually ask people to reflect on sonic environments. So of course the critiques about this work is that per the participants were only six during the first study, then six in the other study, and 
it's good anyway to test uh, new ideas and develop further research prototypes. That graphical prototype could be digitized. There could be more collaboration in map making, which is what I'm trying to, to do, like to kind of uh, gather the interest of residents. And also, the next steps are to send a survey about education in acoustics, where acoustics is taught, if it's taught in architecture schools, uh, and, and see uh, if architects actually can be engaged in studying sonic matters. And uh, also, um, regarding measurements, uh, it's quite hard to find open source tools to do uh, psychoacoustic feature extraction, so like sharpness and loudness. I mean, there's for loudness, but other parameters is quite they're quite blocked uh, in the um, uh, professional tools. Uh, also, the sound level meter, I have to say. So this is a list of publications. Some of them are in press or happening soon. And yeah, if you have any question, I'm happy to take them. Open for question. No question. So the idea was to use the exercise as a self-training procedure. So the participants were invited to listen for one minute, answer to two general questions like um, how would you describe the ambience of this place? How does it make you feel? So this data is published in the first paper and uh, the results. And then they were asked to do this descriptive uh, exercise and after they were asked to reflect on acoustics. So I was trying to allow them to think about the entire sonic environment at different levels, not just the feel or not just the sonic textures. And I was inviting them to think about presence. So it's like uh, not distance of sound, but presence. So I, I wanted to ask them to, to note how loud sounds were uh, relative to each other and how this was uh, uh, definable spatially and uh, in terms of uh, sonic perception and not in terms of what is making the sound because sounds you cannot see you don't know what they are sometimes but we are so used to recognize them that we we are not so used to describe their nature basically so I wanted them to to think about the nature of sound and how it was perceived that was the end yes please So I did three studies. The first study was sitting interviews for like uh, 20 minutes, well, more or less 20 minutes, and they were not walking. They were just standing and they were experts in sound space. So I had really in-depth interviews about their way of describing sound and uh, describing sound space. Second study was with a homogeneous set of sound design students, so they were all like 20 years old, studying second year. And the third study was instead with kind of the one in Spital fields. People were apart from my, mostly from my university, but with a various age. I took the, their background in uh, experience in sound, space, or like special sound, special studies, and also music sometimes. And actually in, this, in the last study, in the oral fabric, I also took, I tried to correlate the experience in music and performing attitudes, especially for the last case, because some people really played the fabric as an instrument rather than, and other people walked instead, so. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> I think that probably Dario Dorazio has uh, some information for the technical visit. Anyway, before leaving, uh, thanks uh, all the speakers and the audience uh, to be here.